Welcome back to the Muse and Greg. In this video, I'm going to walk you through how I installed and wired up six flexible solar panels on the roof of my pop top caravan in preparation for a three month road trip. I'll show you how I calculated exactly which panels and regulators I needed, what tools and materials you will need to do the job yourself, and how well the final system worked. The first thing to consider is how much solar do I actually need? As a rule of thumb, take your battery capacity in amp hours and double it to get the number of watts of solar you should aim for. So, if you had a 100 amp hour battery, aim for 200 watts of solar. This allows you to fully recharge your batteries in about 8 hours of daylight. Just to show you how this works using that example, a 100 amp hour battery simply means it will be fully recharged from 100 amps flowing into it for 1 hour. That's what amp hours means. This also works if you supply 50 amps for 2 hours, 25 amps for 4 hours, or as we need, 12.5 amps for 8 hours to fully recharge our battery. Now my past testing of solar panels shows that they usually deliver around about two thirds of their rated capacity in the real world, so a 200 watt solar panel is likely to deliver around about 130 watts in the real world. From that we can calculate that this panel will deliver around about 10.8 amps at 12 volts, which is roughly what we need to recharge our battery. Now my van has got 480 amp hours of lithium in total with three 160 amp hour batteries, so double that figure means I'm aiming for 960 watts of solar. I don't quite have room for that on my roof, but I'm going to go for 900 watts, which is six 150 watt panels. If you're still working out what size battery you need, post a description of what's in your system in the comments below and I'll see if I can help. First, measure the free space on your roof to work out how much room is available for the panels. Make sure they won't cover the sealant around the edge of the roof so you can get to this if you ever have to fix up leaks or reseal out first if you've got no choice. Now you can start looking for suitable panels that'll fit into this space. If you've got a pop top vehicle, you'll probably have to choose flexible solar panels as they're much lighter than glass panels, but you can test the weight of whatever panels you're considering by adding bricks or other items of the same weight to the roof and see if you can lift it comfortably. The glass panels I first picked out were about 45 kilos in total and it was very difficult to lift the roof with the 45 kilos of bricks on top. If you've got a hard top vehicle, you can consider glass panels, which are heavier, but they typically have a better lifespan. I originally selected these ATEM 110 watt solar panels. They were narrow enough to fit on either side of the air conditioning unit, and the short length gave me plenty of options to arrange them however I wanted. Unfortunately, Vic Offroad ran out of stock and couldn't supply them, so I ended up switching to six of these 150 watt iTech World panels. They were well priced, and I've generally had a decent run with iTech World so far, but I was happy to try something else. When it came to mounting the panels, I followed the excellent system described by Solar for RVs, and I'll be demonstrating this method shortly. Now, I'm not going to repeat everything they've said in the article, but I'd highly recommend you read it through so you understand what the process is. But in short, don't attach flexible panels directly to the roof of your vehicle, as they'll overheat, which will in turn damage the roof of your vehicle, and there's also no way for the panel to expand as it heats up, which will probably then damage the panel. You need to mount the panel on strips of 10mm twin wall polycarbonate and attach this with flexible foam double sided tape. This provides a decent air gap to keep it cool and enough mobility for the panel to flex as it needs to. These strips should be mounted widthways, not lengthways, across the back of the panel and spaced around 100 to 150 millimetres apart. The closer the better really to avoid sagging. Now do not use core flute from an old real estate sign or something similar. That stuff's only 3 millimetres thick and it's made from different material to what the panels are made from so it'll expand at a different rate. Here's the right way to do it. I bought this twin wall polycarbonate sheet from Bunnings. This piece of rectangular conduit to sit around the front of the panels to stop wind getting underneath. And I bought this VHB, which stands for very high bond, double sided tape from Solar for RVs. Now don't do what I was going to do and just run down to Bunnings and grab some double sided tape from there. This heavy duty scotch tape has served me well for many jobs in the past, but after many inquiries I found it's only rated to a maximum 38 degrees Celsius, above which the adhesive starts softening. Now the panels are going to get a lot hotter than 38 degrees and the tape is the only thing holding them on your roof, so don't cut corners here. Get stuff that's designed for solar panels. This is a very big job to redo if you use the wrong stuff, trust me. And the proper stuff actually worked out cheaper anyway. Here's how I calculated how much of everything I was going to need. Pause the video here if you want to follow my workings, but I'm going to carry on. Once I got the supplies, I used my table saw to cut the polycarbonate panel into about 40 different 12mm wide strips. The table saw was certainly the quickest and easiest way to do this job if you happen to have one, but you can use a circular saw too if that's all you've got, although this was somewhat slower and less controlled than the table saw. 
At a push, you could even use a jigsaw or even a hacksaw, but these are gonna be a lot slower, and there can be a number of strips to cut up, so think about how long it's gonna take. Don't bother trying with a standing knife, the material is just too thick. As each strip of core flute gave you one and a half strips for the panels, half of the strips I needed had to be made up of two of these shorter strips. Each strip of core flute then needed double sided tape on each side. I was originally going to add screws to each corner for a bit of insurance to prevent them getting blown off the roof, but in the end this proved too difficult to get the silicon into the screw hole in the roof with all the core flute and tape and everything else all around it. And the tape ended up sticking so well I felt this was unnecessary anyway. I cleaned the back of the iTech weld panel with methylated spirits, peeled off the backing from the first strip of core flute and laid the back two pieces down. I then laid out all the others so I knew exactly where they were going to go and did the same with them. As you can see the end piece isn't stuck down yet. I then got the conduit ready for the front of the panel. I cut this to length then cut out the section for the cable connections and slid that into place. The core flute fitted nicely under this and there wasn't enough thickness for the double sided tape but I held it in place with a smear of this Selly's 650 Fast Cure sealant which is like a mixture between no more gaps and silicon. It's quite flexible and it can be painted too. I've only applied this to the bottom of the core flute, it isn't stuck to the panel itself as the conduit itself will be stuck onto the roof of the van and that's going to hold the panel in place. This unbonded section allows the front edge of the panel to move a little bit as it warms up. The last thing in, then is to add double sided tape to the back of the conduit. So that's one panel completed. The weight of a bare panel was 2.8 kilos and the final weight of the panel with all the tape and the core flute assembled was only 3.2 kilos. So all those extra bits and pieces have only added about 500 grams. After giving the roof a good clean, I slipped the panels up onto the roof and carefully got them into exactly the right position. As I said, you ideally want to make sure you can get to any silicon that's sealing the roof in case you need to do some repair work. But the closer you put the panel to the air conditioning unit, the more shadow you're going to get on the panels when the sun's at an angle, so this is a bit of a trade-off. Then it was just a matter of taking the backing off the tape and carefully resting the panel into the right position. I could then lift up the front edge and slip the conduit under the leading edge, after which the whole panel with the front conduit all together could be pressed into its final position. The process was the same up the front. I ended up rotating the front two panels so the cable wasn't poking up at the front of the van. If you're finding this useful so far, please hit those like and subscribe buttons, it helps a heap. And if the time I've spent documenting all this has saved you some time, money and hassle and working it all out for yourself, please consider a small donation via the thanks button. I really appreciate your support. Wiring everything up is an area where newbies really should consult a 12 volt expert for specific advice because things can go badly wrong if you don't know what you're doing. But I'll try to explain basically what I do. To keep things simple, let's use a hypothetical 200 watt solar panel, which at full power delivers 20 volts of voltage and 10 amps of current. And we'll imagine we've got four of these panels in our system. There are three basic ways that panels could be connected up. You could connect all the panels in parallel, where all the positives of the panel get joined together, all the negatives get joined together, and the single positive and single negative terminals run into your solar regulator. When panels are wired in parallel, the panel voltage stays the same, but the current from each panel gets added together. In this example, this would give a total of 20 volts and 40 amps. You can connect all the panels in series, where they're all essentially daisy chained together. The positive of the first panel goes to the regulator, while the negative of that panel joins to the positive of the next panel, and so on and so on until the negative of the last panel goes back to the negative of the regulator. When panels are wired like this in series, the panel voltages get added together, but it's the current that stays the same. So in this example, it would give a total of 80 volts and 10 amps. And lastly, you can use a combination of the two, which is common in larger systems, and that's what I ended up doing. So what are the pros and cons of series and parallel wiring, and which one do you choose? Well, many solar regulators have got a maximum input voltage of around about 30 volts, so wiring the panels in parallel means your system's going to work with almost any solar regulator that can handle the combined current. You need to make sure your existing wiring is up to that extra current too. The lower voltage you get from parallel connections also ensures there's no risk of an electric shock, Whereas with series connections, the total voltage can end up above 50 volts, which is where you have to start being a little bit more careful. Parallel connections are also more shade tolerant. Shade reduces current a lot more than it reduces voltage. So shade on part of your array will only drop the current from that one panel without greatly affecting the rest of the system. Just like a slow moving car in one lane of a four lane motorway only affects the traffic in that single lane. 
when all the panels are in series, there's only one route for the current to flow. So that one panel behaves like a slow car and reduces the current from all the panels. The biggest issue with parallel connections is that they generally lose more power than series connections. Firstly, the higher current results in more voltage drop in the cables, where you get less voltage at the regulator end of the cable than you do at the panels themselves. This ultimately means less power going into your batteries. I cover these principles a bit more in my series on electronics, the basics. Now this problem is made worse because parallel connections usually also require more cable because each panel has to have its own dedicated positive and negative cable, where series connections can often use the existing cables to just link onto the neighbouring panel. And all those cables have to go through a big joiner to bring them all down to one single outlet. And this also adds to the total cost of your setup. The extra current in your system also means that any poor connections are more likely to overheat, as happened to me when one of my Renergy 3 to 1 connectors melted. Now my six iTech World panels deliver roughly 20 volts at 7.6 amps at full power, so I ended up connecting these in three groups of two. Two panels in series, another two in series, and the last two in series to give about 40 volts and 7.6 amps per group, and then I connected these three groups of panels together in parallel with each other to give a total output of 40 volts and 22.8 amps going into the regulator. I could have done three series and two parallel for 60 volts and 15 amps, but I was concerned about shading on the rear panels from the air conditioner. Whatever you choose, make sure your solar regulator and your wiring are able to handle the total voltage and current you'll end up with. Which brings us to... Regulators typically specify a maximum input voltage and a maximum output current. You should already know your input voltage by now. For me, it's going to be about 40 volts, but what's the output current going to be? Presuming you're using a good quality MPPT solar regulator, which I would highly recommend for any new installations, the solar regulator will decrease the voltage down to about 13 volts to suit your batteries and increase the current by about the same ratio. But to work out what the output current's going to be, we're going to use the same power formula, power equals voltage times current, or in this case, we'll rearrange it to current equals power divided by voltage. The power is the power of your solar setup, 900 watts in my case, and because we're trying to calculate the output parameters, the voltage we'd use here is the 13 volts output for your batteries. So this tells me that my regulator will deliver about 69 amps of output current into my batteries. Now I could go and find a regulator that will take a 40 volt input and 70 volt output, but from my previous solar blanket reviews, I know that most solar panels only achieve about 65-70% to 70 of their rated power, and a lot less in overcast conditions, so my 70 amp regulator would likely never actually reach 70 amps. So if you wanted to save a little bit of money, you can work on most panels only delivering about 80% of their rating. I'll redo my sums now by multiplying my solar setup power by 80%, or 0.8, and this is now the power that my setup is most likely going to deliver. In my case, it's going to be 720 watts. So repeating our sums, 720 divided by 13 now gives a likely maximum of 55 amps output current. So I can now go shopping for a regulator with at least a 40 volt maximum input and around about 55 amps maximum output. Given my input voltage will be above 30 volts, I'm choosing a Victron MPPT regulator as they can handle higher voltages, but honestly Victron products are great value for almost any build. Don't bother with a PWM regulator in a new build, and I'd avoid those cheap units that claim to be MPPT but don't really perform. You can probably take a royal guess at which brands they might be. Now I've bought all of my Victron stuff from Energy Eco because their prices were always the best I could find and their email and phone support has always been responsive. So I've just teamed up with them to give you guys a bit of extra value. Use coupon code MUSING in checkout, and at the time I recorded this, they'll throw in a free gift, but they're working on a proper affiliate program which will hopefully bring some additional benefits when that's live, which may be by the time you see this. And hey, if I'm lucky, I might even get a bit of love back from your purchase to help fund my channel costs. So make sure you head across to Energy Eco for anything Victron or Enerdrive, and they've got some other cool off-grid stuff that's worth checking out too. Now Victron regulators have got two figures in their model numbers. The first is the maximum input voltage, the second is the maximum output current. So a 75 slash 15 regulator can handle 75 volts max input and delivers 15 amps max output. As you can see, 75 volts is the lowest input voltage any of these regulators can handle, so they'd all deal with my 40 to 45 volt input voltage. Now the perfect regulator for this job would have been the 150 slash 70 70 amp unit to let me get every last watt of power out of the system, but I ended up going with the 100 slash 50 MPPT regulator for this job. It was physically a lot smaller to be able to fit in where I needed it to, it was half the price, and 95% of the time I didn't expect the output current was going to get past 50 amps very much anyway. 
It's then just a matter of connecting the output of your solar array to the input of the regulator and the output of the regulator back into your batteries. Make sure the cable you use is thick enough for the current it's going to take. Solar for RVs has got a good calculator to help you with that. And note you should also include suitably rated fuses in line with each solar panel and on the output of the regulator. The system has worked exactly the way we hoped. Across three months of travelling 15,000 kilometres through Northern Territory and outback Queensland, our 480 amp hour batteries never dropped below 30%. The DC to DC charger charged the batteries from our vehicle whenever we were travelling, but even when we stayed put for a few days, the solar panels kept the batteries nicely charged. The solar system maxed out at 705 watts, which was 13.75 volts and 50.2 amps, and under these conditions a bigger regulator might have given us a bit more power. But most days the maximum solar output was more like 450 to 500 watts, or around 35 amps. So the 50 amp regulator was definitely the right choice, and having all of this data available in the Victron Connect app is a big bonus with any Victron smart solar regulator. Note that the blue solar units puzzlingly don't actually have Bluetooth. The regulator kept its cool too, and even when it was producing its full 50 amps at 700 watts, it only got up to 46 degrees, which is another great result. The double-sided tape held the panels down very well, even in hot conditions, and I didn't need the fixing screws. As you can see, the panel stuck down very well here. After 8 months of use, a couple of the edges were lifting ever so slightly, but we're talking probably a centimetre here out of a strip that's 67cm long, so certainly nothing of concern. I accidentally leaned too heavily on one section of the panel when installing this panel, and that crushed the core flute a bit, and this meant a neighbouring section of the panel behind it lifted up a bit. But I added another strip of tape underneath and had no further problems. So this proper VHB double sided tape has certainly been the right choice for this job. I've had no complaints from the ITIC World panels, even though they weren't my first choice for this build. That 705 watt maximum I saw was being limited by the regulator, but that's still 78.3% of the 900 watt rating, and that's a fair bit better than the 65 to 70% I've seen from most solar blankets. I may test these in a different video, but if they're looking good to you and you want a discount on these or anything else from iTech World, make sure you use coupon code MUSING in checkout on iTech World's site. So if you've got any questions, please post them in the comments below and I'll try to help as best as I can. If this has helped you get your own panel installation right, please like, subscribe and share it with others. And if you're feeling generous, you can buy me a coffee with that thanks button below. But that's all for now, so I'll catch you next time.